Hello. Hello, Albert. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Good. Thank you. Okay. Do you like? You can unmute yourself for the time being, and then we'll get on to the contact. Hi. 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 Okay. You guys are live on um, YouTube as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh really? Oh, that's interesting. Yep, I'm I'm sending out the information live as well. So let me just check my YouTube whether I can switch over to the presentation. Ah, yes, I can. Okay. So today we were talking about. Um, how China turns desert into fruiting oasis, and hopefully today I can also play the video with sound. Okay, shall we start? Yeah. Okay, let me share screen, and I'm sharing this screen. Mm -hmm. On YouTube, also sending this screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How China turns desert into fruiting oasis. Um, the I I just I don't have much to say. Actually, it is I'm showing you a movie mostly. So. Just a little bit of background. Uh, China has quite a bit of de uh, desert. Uh, three thousand six hundred square uh, square kilometers. So because of that, each year there's a a lot of soil is being blown off, and turning into desert. So China really need to increase its um cover. So China over the uh. Uh, forty years, it, the Chinese, uh, China's a uh, forest cover increased from a uh, five percent to ten percent. So there's quite a bit of um, uh, forest uh building. But in order to actually keep the forest working, the more important is how to make it sustainable. China has this so-called free north Shelton forest uh, program stretching along the border of the Gobi Desert and the mainland around this ridge. Building a forest uh, belt on this ridge will prevent all the dust blowing from the west into the capital like Beijing somewhere here and so forth. So China has been quite active in doing that. As of uh, 2009, um, the human planted forest is over 500,000 square kilometers. So that is quite a, quite a bit of increase. Unfortunately, uh, many of them <laughs> died, but if it's not all died, then there's hope. So they will come back and plant again, come back and plant again. So I'm now showing you a video. Can you hear the sound? Yep. Good, thank you. This episode of Travelog, I'm journeying to China's northwest to explore the desert world of Misa. There, I'll discover the ingenious methods being employed we have to carve out a patch of paradise yep. amidst all the sands. Ah, you don't get much better views than this. 
You've got the dunes, you've got the Yellow River, that massive mountain range in the distance. Now this is Ningxia. When you hear the name, most people will think of beautiful deserts, but also fertile farmlands, because over the centuries, locals have adapted to and now thrive in this extreme, but also contrasting environment. I'm Sharan. Welcome to this episode of Travelogue, and welcome to Ningxia. <laughs> Located in northern China, the Ningxiahui Autonomous Region is one of the country's smallest regions. Here the days are long, dry and scorching hot, for the desert and its climate are never far away. This is a little bit unexpected. I mean, usually when you think of a, an oasis, it's a uh, lake within a desert, but here we've actually got a desert surrounded by a lake. It's my first time seeing this kind of landscape. Ninja 你的手上。It comes as a surprise to find a bird reserve in the desert. But I'm reliably informed that of five main avian migration routes in China, two pass through here. Shahu literally translates as sand lake, and unless you're a bird, the only way to get around is by boat. Which is fine, because it gets you closer to the reeds where the birds nest. Sometimes you'll even catch a glimpse of them feeding on the shrimps and fish that teem in Xiaohu's shallow waters. Ah, uh, complacent swans. To be fair, they're not the only birds partial to a pleasant environment. One of the most common birds you'll see here is the grey heron. It's known to be very picky about where it nests, but once it's chosen a site, it comes back year after year. This has been a pretty eye-opening for me because I always thought of the desert as being barren and inhospitable and, you know, not home to any kind of life whatsoever. But it's exactly the opposite over here. It's, it's full of life and water too, which is quite unusual. Sixty kilometers away from Xiahu is Yinchuan's Museum of Contemporary Art. It too has a link to the Yellow River in its walls. The wavy design is supposed to represent the layers of sediment left by the river's migration over the centuries. The current exhibition here is aptly named Starting from the Desert, Ecologies on the Edge. Still 
，跟自己的居住生活条件和自然究竟是什么关系呢？所以他其实在提出问题。This is the museum's second Biennale. Its first attracted headliners like Anish Kapoor and Yoko Ono. This time round, the focus is on artists from desert countries, many of them Central Asian. It's an interesting look at how we've shaped the environments we live in, <coughs> and how the desert is viewed by cultures around the world. And the exhibits aren't just limited to galleries inside the museum. <coughs> wow, man, it's it's so lush over here. It's almost kind of hard to believe that we're so close to the desert. This gazebo faces a place called Sihai Gu, which supposedly has the harshest living conditions in all of Lingxia, but. As you've seen from the Biennale, people are always able to survive in any condition. Where there's a will, there's always a way. The northern tip of Ningxia is dominated by the Tengger and Ordus deserts. Here, the Yellow River makes a dramatic U-turn, and in doing so, it forms the panoramic vistas of the Shapuotou scenic area. While its dunes may look forbidding, today this region is one of Ningxia's best-loved tourist destinations. Oh wow, that's gorgeous, man! It feels like we're on a different planet. You can also go sand sledding and camel riding, but this definitely takes the cake. There's no better way to explore the desert. Hold on to your seats. Woo! Here we go. <laughs> In the past, the desert must have been a nightmare for travelers, but now it's the best playground ever. However, there's a problem with this playground. It's expanding. For generations, people tried to stop the growth. Then, a few decades ago, a method was discovered quite by chance when a sandstorm blew away everything except for some straw that had been planted in the sand. This simple method, developed in China, has now been adopted by countries including South Africa, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. They slowly found that the best way to 薄薄的一层一铺，沙子呢，阻力大，不太厚的话，扎射不进去。如果是深度不够的话，风一吹，草墙就倒了。飘头垂直于沙面，这样的话阻力小，垂直敲顶倾斜，稍微往下压一点，然后脚踩上去啊，猛然发力。哎呦哎呦哎呦！歪了，手要把敲顶抓紧，不然的话敲头会左右晃，还容易伤到脚。对，扎射好以后呢，我们还有一道工序，就说会把。Last but not least, to finish off the straw wall, the seeds of some hardy desert shrubs are planted in the grids. Quite interesting, though. I think uh, often with inventions, you do have that eureka moment, but it's, it usually comes when you're least expecting it. Kind of hard to imagine that just you know simple pieces of straw are able to stop an entire desert, but I guess little by little, it builds up until you can stop an entire movement.
Coming up next, I discover how the ancients mastered the Yellow River and used it to transform the desert into fertile land. So as beautiful as the desert is, it can't support life without water. And here we not only have oases, we have the mighty Yellow River, which is China's mother river. The Yellow River forms the southern boundary of the Tengara Desert, effectively cutting it off from the rest of Nixia. However, very early on, some clever clogs figured out a way to get from one side to the other. <笑>这个是什么呀这同意远处看了好像绑了好多头猪似的哎不是不是不是这就是我们黄河上最一古老的交通有工具羊皮筏子那这应该有一段时间的历史的吧呃两千一百多年的历史黄河上有游牧民族
他就是使得我们名下从五霸已经走向五霸已经走向，结束了我们名下两千多年来五霸已经走的历史。名下以前的棺材面积仅仅只有一百七十万亩，有了这座土地在之后，他现在的棺材面积达到了七百万亩。Over the centuries, the Yellow River irrigation system has been built on and improved countless times. Today, it's one of the oldest irrigation projects in the world that's still in use. Look, this part of the river is our main river. The first river is the Huang Hoang River. The river is about 2,300 years old. The river is still in use. Yes, the river is still in use. Wow, man, that's incredible. This is really an amazing feat of human engineering. I mean, it, it, it's because of this, I guess, that, uh, that Ming says what it is today. Ningxia is one of China's poorest regions, and that's largely due to the lack of water. The fact is, the Yellow River only flows through northern Ningxia, leaving parts of the south dry and impoverished. Which makes it all the more surprising to see this lush greenery. In fact, for centuries, this little pocket of Ningxia has been an important rice-producing region. It's thanks to the irrigation project that farmers have been able to grow rice in such an arid area. Here, the Yellow River is very much their lifeline. The local saying has it that in the most drought-stricken parts of Ningxia, if it doesn't rain, you don't eat. In many ways, it's a luxury to be trying this rice. It's really tasty actually, it's, um, you can pretty much taste every single grain of rice. To be honest, before I came here, I kept hearing people say, oh, the Yellow River is the um, cradle of Chinese civilization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, you kind of don't realize it until you come here and you've seen that the Yellow River has basically turned um, the desert into fertile land and provided livelihood for so many people and at the end of the day given us this really tasty bowl of rice. Coming up next, I learn about the importance of the Herland Mountains and the precious products found on and below its peaks. Okay, I will stop here because um, it is about time for our discussion. Mm. So we we see that uh, in, from the movie that uh, first of all, Chinese desert is quite different from the desert in, for example, Sahara. We actually have a river flow, flowing. <laughs> very close to the desert <laughs> yellow river just next to the desert so that's one <laughs> interesting thing so they are not lack of water is rather the climate that is the problem so how do we store the the the, the desert the solution is quite different from i i think from other other parts of the world because water is not the important thing here is rather how do you stop the sand from moving? So their their straw, a squares becomes very useful. 
So they show what they have shown you in the, in the video is only the uh, labor way of putting the straw in. Today they have uh, implemented uh, automatic uh, straw laying machines on on a on a truck. So basically, the trucks lay out the the straw, and then another roller press the straw into the sand to form the square. So that. That's, they have increased their their uh, productivity by quite a margin. Okay, any comments on anyone? Um, I was going to say, Albert, that um, yes, I um, I agree that um, having having a river right next to the desert is a pretty phenomenal thing. I can't see um, too many deserts in the world with that um, luxury. Yes. Although I do think the um, the idea of the straw barriers is such a, a simple and, and seems such an effective way of at least stopping the um, the desert increasing, which I understand is nevertheless a, a problem in most countries where there is a desert. The the um, it does seem to be shifting and and increasing rather than um, uh, contracting. So um, maybe maybe other countries can also do the the sand. Um, straw burying the straw and so forth. That might, that sounds like a, a really good idea. Yeah, the the no, the the straw basically stop the sand from moving, yeah. and therefore you can plant some something in in the middle of the square. So uh, there are plants which strive on say about ten centimeters of rainfall per year. In answer to Mary, um, you have got something a little bit similar in Australia where uh, in the middle of the Great Australian Desert, you've got Lake Eyre. But, of course, um, the size of um, Lake Eyre does vary from very small to very large. Um, it used to be, on... too, I think, Albert, the, um, the Lake Eyre... They used to say that it was only filled about once every four, 40 years, but um, I don't I don't think that's a very accurate one because I know it's been filled several times in in my lifetime, and I'm yes. not that old. And but it's always got some water in it. Oh, has it? Yeah, yeah. E even if it's just a drop, but there is some water in it. Mm. Oh, no. But I, I think the, the issue with water is that we have plenty of water on Earth. Is The problem is the water is not fresh water, and it is not at the place we want it to be. Mm. So and it's a matter of... This, so that's why I'm, I'm, I've been thinking, where energy becomes even cheaper, we might be able to transport large volume of water from one area to other area. When that happens, then ecology will change. Mm -hmm. I know um, there's every so often there's um, especially when they have the floods up in Queensland, there's um, noises going around. Oh, we need to we need to establish a big pipeline of uh, from Queensland rivers to come down to irrigate further. Um, the areas which are otherwise suffering in drought, but um, I think the um, I understand it's the cost of transporting water which is prohibitive. You know whether it's in a pipeline and just sort of feeding it, you know, waiting for the volumes to push it down to float to make it flow to somewhere else. I, I don't know, but it, it, um, it seems to be the the big factor in um, in uh, irrigation. Um, Plans and proposals is that the cost of transporting water is just prohibitively expensive. It, I think it depends. For example, in China, they have a project called uh, North to South Water Transfer. I'm uh, sorry, a South to North, South to North. Water Transfer. Yeah. Mm. So they are transporting about 10% of the water from Yangtze River to Yellow River. So that's a huge amount of water. Yeah, yeah. And the other examples I might give is actually Hong Kong. Hong Kong um, water is supplied from the mainland by two pipes. Uh, the pipe's diameter is about, I think, 
less than the height of a man, the pipe. So it's mm. 1.5 meters, something like that. It's two pipes mm. running 24 hours a day, uh, supplying all the water needs for about six and a half million people in Hong Kong. So mm. it depends. It Sometimes it's doable. So when, for example, uh, the energy... Uh, becomes cheap at the moment it's not feasible because we are using fossil energy so mm. when we are using for example renewable energy we can actually make use of um, the availability of uh, 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 natural energy uh, the, the renewable energy to transport water when for example when the sun is not shining you you stop the water flow when the sun is shining then you keep on pumping and for another for another uh, commodity like um the the oil um oil has been transported long distances all over the world oil pipes hmm. for example um china get a lot of oil from russia so the the oil pipes is talking about thousands of kilometers long so i think it's possible but it all depends on whether there's commercial effort the problem with us is that the water we can get from our surrounding are seawater if we if there's a big uh, fresh water then it becomes much better but so i think to us is converting fresh water uh, seawater into fresh water that's the energy demanding part Albert, there was a, a proposal talked about in Australia uh, for fresh water to bring it down from New Guinea from the Fly River, where when it's wet, it's really wet, and do that by pipeline. And I think it was going to be mostly gravity fed. But then comes to the other comment that was made, you probably get enough to make the river flow for a small part of the year when they're very wet, but the rest of the time you, um, you're still in the same situation. Yeah. When the gold fields opened in uh, the Kalgoorlie Coolgardie area, uh, there was very little water. Um, there was a dam built um, not that far east of Perth and huge pipes, um, nearly a thousand, oh, how far is um, Kalgoorlie from Perth? What, 500 k's? Um, that the water was um, um, transported. Well, I, I think our Queensland got quite a bit of water, isn't it? Sorry? Queensland. Queensland, yes. yeah. Yes. So you, Although there has been droughts in some areas um, this year. But what, what about we, we actually built a large dam in, in Queensland, collect the rainwater and then pipe it down... If, for, say along the east coast. I think that I will have no idea what the economics of that sort of thing are, but they they keep talking, they keep um, having proposals for that, and um, given that we haven't got one yet, I suspect that we haven't quite got the commercial um, yeah um, balance quite right I, yet. I think we we are waiting for the energy to to become cheaper. Mm. The East Coast isn't really the problem. Um, there is water along the East Coast. It's the inland and um, to some extent, uh, Western Australia where the problems are. Mm. I, I think if you, you really want to do it long term, we, we should start thinking a uh, great dream moving inland rather than starting from inland. So we we, we if we want to uh, develop Australia, we, we should make use of the inland as our solar energy source because there's less rain and mostly sunshine. So we build large solar farms in the middle, in the, in the, in the desert, and then pipe the energy back to the, the rest of the, uh, Australia. And while that's going on, we can... Also, when you 
constructive power supply, you can basically also at the same time construct a water pipe. Albert, have you heard of the goiter line? No. Okay, goiter, um, very early uh, in white settlement of South Australia, goiter drew a line and he said on one side of the line there is enough water for farming. On the other side of the line, don't build your farms, there's not enough water. Now, the irony is that just after the Goida line was um, was put on the map, um, there was a lot of rain and the areas where Goida said you couldn't farm, you were able to farm for about 10 years. And everybody said, oh, he was mad, this is ridiculous. We now know um, that he historically was absolutely correct. And uh, yeah, uh, south of the Goida line farms, north of the Goida line, no farms. So where's mm. that Goida line? <laughs> Um, through the middle of South Australia. Middle of oh. South Australia. Let me just do a quick search. How does it spell that again? Yeah. G O Y D E R. G O Y D E R. Okay, I find it. Got the line. It's taking me back to primary school um, geography there. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, my, jo my geography isn't in Australia, so I don't know that. <laughs> yeah, um, I think um, the, um, I, I can't quite remember where it goes, but I, I was, um, about this time last year, we were travelling around in, um, oh, yeah around Murray Bridge and I was really surprised to see the vast solar panel farms that they have there. I, I, it was mind-blowing just how big they were and how extensive and um, I, th I think until we're sort of out there and, and seeing some of these things, I hadn't realised that we were, you know, so so advanced. I'm sure there's, there's lots of space where we can fit a few more but um, of course I guess it's the um, storage that's the the problem at the moment, isn't it? It's all it's all great while the sun is shining, um, but um, the storage um, aspects make make um, you know the renewables at the moment um, a bit less than optimum. Yeah, there's also a lot of big farms in um, the Wimmera, in Victoria. Yeah. Yes. Okay, if you don't mind, I'm going to interrupt you a little bit by uh, sharing the screen of the Gorda line. Okay, I'm going to share the screen here. Share. Okay, the Gorda line, according to here, is uh, in South Australia. And there is a rich and looking from the map, we see that it is green on one side, it's brown on the other side. Uh -huh. So that's the border line. I think the moisture coming from um, from the south will condense where it is rising through the ridge, and therefore there's plenty of water on this side. But once it's over, then there's not much rain left, and therefore it becomes barren and dry. Because our the our our wind directions from sea is in, from the west to east in this <coughs> direction, and therefore along this side the same thing happened. So the Gorda line, let me just see where I show you the the um the physical line. Okay, where's the physical line? Here, the physical line here oh, is yeah. the red line. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So it is mm. a, a, along the edge, isn't it? Just right on the top of the mountain. Mm. <coughs> and the south of it, with all the uh, moisture coming from the, the mm. south pole and being condensed when it's rising and then over the over the other side is dry. So it's quite similar to China in the same sense, in that sense. Oh, yeah. Mm. Well, China... That's interesting. 
China, you know, um, we have the Himalaya. On the mm -hmm. other side of the Himalaya is, is um, India. Nepal. Nepal, India. Nepal. They are very, very wet. Mm. So all the moisture coming from India Ocean flowing over the Himalaya will get condensed and then fall on before the 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 moisture crosses over the Himalaya. So on the other side of the Himalaya, which is China, is dry. But on this side, on the Indian side, it is very wet. So in on the Indian side we have what? Uh Vietnam, Cambodia, India, <coughs> etc. They are all wet countries. Mm. But once you mm. over so I think that the quarter line is the same same thing. Thank you, yeah. Albert, for teaching us yeah. a geography. Yeah. <laughs> Albert, yeah. I can add to that. Decades ago, I saw a very pie in the sky proposal in that same area. And the idea was to build an artificial mountain range out of concrete with terraces and trees on it, a thousand feet high. It was hollow to take grain. It had a canal beside it. And the idea was at that height, it would uh, the, the western clouds would uh, hit the mountain, drop rain, and that could be collected. And you had your, uh, for farming, um, and then you could take the grain, store it in the thing, and then take it out by boat. I'm not sure how far up north it went, but it would have been all South Australia, maybe maybe a bit more, or maybe it was only part. Mm. I, don't, I think I've well lo lost a bit of paper that it was on, but it was quite a story. Very pie in the sky. If it was to be costed these days, it'd, uh, it'd, it'd, it'd blow, blow the financial figures out of the sky. Cyril, <laughs> if, you call, if you call that pie in the sky, that's an insult to pies in the <laughs> sky. <laughs> <laughs> Just over the top. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Another little um, fact on that thing too. Apparently, with um, um, the the most in one, the, when we're talking about the most um, intensive industries and so forth for um, um, impacting on carbon emissions and so forth, concrete. If, if it were a country, concrete manufacturing would be the fourth largest emitter um, in the world. So, oh. Oh. while we're trying to, <coughs> trying to um, manipulate the climate for that pie in the sky oh. project, we're really, um, making a, a worse mess of the climate, <laughs> probably. Yeah, you're right on there, Mary. <laughs> but I think um, construction materials will will change later on. I I might not be able to see it, but I I will I sense that. There is a lot of material science going on, and the future materials will be quite different. For example, for graphene coming in, and composite materials. So I, I think uh, in the future, our car may not be made of metal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Much lighter, stronger, using uh, fiberglass. I, but at the moment, fiberglass is, cannot be mass produced. That is the problem. It's the cost is high. But once they figure out how to do it, then it will be a different matter. Actually, I think my car is already covered in plastic rather than mesh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the pump, the pump. I think the pumpers are plastic. Yeah, I think the pumpers are plastic. But the body is still, still. Uh, quite metal, but mm -hmm. but I I I suppose we'll be very soon we'll see a car completely made out of composite material. Mm. It's coming. Yeah. Mary, you know why it's so? It's cheaper to produce, and when you damage it or those that damage their bumpers etc., they're not fixable much. Uh, they really got <laughs> to be replaced. Have to be so, replaced. So yeah. they build in a. Uh, an annuity for themselves. Yes. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I had, I actually had thought that there was, um, it was to try and keep the uh, fuel efficiency of the car 
if the car is lighter, then it would keep the, the fuel efficiency uh, would be improved. But actually, Cyril, you're probably right. Yeah. <laughs> But it has the side benefit that you said there, obviously. <laughs> well, the the you you know the uh, oil pass go to negative uh, last month. Mm. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, we all know yes. that. I went down that day, Albert, to get some a barrel of fuel and get my forty dollars, but I couldn't lift the barrel into the back of the wagon. <laughs> and I, I got some for my mower. Uh, in the tin and uh, got it for 93 cents, which is unheard of, you know. Yeah. I thought oh, I've got to get some while it's cheap just for, the, just for the satisfaction that it was possible to get cheap petrol. <laughs> Bad news. <laughs> uh, I think to, yesterday was 87 cents. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was to... talking um, on the phone to a friend of mine who now lives in London and works for Shell and... Shell is in an absolute panic, as you can imagine. Um, in London, about a third of the staff uh, is being put off. Mm. <coughs> and that's why we can't get off the fossil fuel, because too much money is uh, locked into these big companies. Mm. So yes. they are unwilling to, to lower the, the price of petrol. Because... Yes. Well, but I think this this will be very rare that we we see petrol is back under one dollar. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you, I think you will last for about <laughs> six months at least until the e uh, the world's economy recover. Then the price will go up. But for the time being, eighty cents, ninety cents would be the norm for a while. I think it was the ABC News last night. Um, you may have seen it. Um, the price is is so different depending on where you are. Um, in the ACT uh, in Canberra, it's what was it about a dollar nineteen? I no. think. <laughs> Sorry, dollar thirty seven or something. Yeah, that high. I've seen. And yeah. you cross the border into New South Wales, and you're under a dollar. Mm. Well, then people will cross the border to buy petrol in New right. South, South Wales. <laughs> but anyway, ACT are people with privileges, so they can afford it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> talking about my late brother and my sister-in-law. <clears throat> okay, anyway. Um, can I can I um, ask with the um, we're watching the little video then of the um, desert and um, keeping the desert from expanding further in China. Last week we were thinking that um, the, the Yuan Longping is uh, the at the forefront of growing rice in desert areas and so forth. Um, I didn't notice any rice starting to grow in that desert that we were looking at, but um, yeah. how I, mean, I, I had a little bit of a look online and I, I could see that the um, <coughs> thing in was it in Arab Emirates there's a big plan for um, having a hundred a, a, an experimental farm of a hundred hundred hectares. That doesn't sound very many. Um, maybe it was 100,000 hectares or something or other. Anyway, a, a, an experimental farm of growing uh, for growing um, rice in in um, Arabia uh, in the desert there. Um, so that will be that will be interesting. I'm not too sure where they're getting their water from there though. Um, whether that was uh, water which is being um, uh, yeah, desalinated uh, sea water. Or what well, do you know? Have you, have anyone looked into that? Well, we can look into that, and then we'll maybe next week. Mm. <laughs> okay, next week we'll, we'll look at uh, growing uh, growing rice and and etc. in desert. Mm. So today is more like a introduction to this topic, and then next week we'll dive a little bit deeper, looking at okay. the technology that's involved.
Okay. Okay, Elvis. Sounds good. Okay. Well, this we, is, can, this can is a I different topic. Yep. <laughs> this is a different topic, Albert. But did you get my uh, email I sent you about 10 days ago about the um, current situation uh, with the protesters in Hong Kong? Yeah, uh, you, you, you guys like me to talk about that sometime in the future? I, I'd be interested. I don't know how other people... Yeah. Yes, I, I would too, Albert. Okay, so... And I would also be interested in um, China. how China's thinking about the COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a big topic. <laughs> yeah, COVID... <laughs> no, I, Naughty Australia. <laughs> I, I want to uh, talk about COVID uh, probably next term rather than this term. The reason is we, we, we don't want to put salt into people's wound. So mm. let, let the COVID calm down first and then we will, mm. we, will, we will be able to look at it in a more objective way, I suppose. Yes. So, okay. yes, I, I plan on talking about the, the COVID-19. But uh, not now. I I think I I would rather see the world's uh, numbers go down first. At the moment, I've been looking at the numbers ev almost every day. It's over, uh, three hundred. Sorry, three something million. Let's just quickly have a look. Three point five. Three point something. Three point five million. Three. Yeah. Three million five hundred and six thousand three hundred and sixty. Yeah. At the moment, mm. and the United States is one million one hundred and sixty one thousand one hundred and nine is about one third is in America. So uh, I I suppose I want to let let it uh, go down a bit first. Let everybody be comfortable before before we talk about it. But that will be very political, I suppose. <laughs> but I think we can bear that. <laughs> Yes, we can. Yeah. <laughs> so can I, uh, probably COVID nineteen in uh, in next term. <laughs> because yeah. I think that's when we meet together. Yeah, we uh yeah when we meet face to face. Hopefully, they will relax it. Uh, this week, fi this Friday. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't think so. No. I, I reckon we've got a little while. Yeah. Yeah. I would say about two June. Yeah, yeah I reckon June. June. Yeah. yeah. Can I make a suggestion that yeah. uh, using this system we're doing is good, but some people have their microphones on and don't realise it, and there's either coughing or paper shuffling that comes through like a roar or phone mm. phone conversation. Just to, if you're not saying anything, there's no need to have it on. Put your own on mute it just makes things a better reception please thank you yeah yeah okay and then actually um i think i will set the default to come in as muted mm -hmm. okay okay I, I will try to set it as muted yeah. when you come in so that will be whatever, whatever and, you think's best albert's fine by us yeah yep. okay Thank you a lot. Okay, Thanks a lot. You. Okay, okay, see, you. Okay, see you. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you, see you Robert. next week. Bye. 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 Bye.